All right, well, that was the best treat of the conference so far. So um, uh, having an awesome, awesome PhD student, a uh, former PhD student introduce one is a treat. And um, as Jay has said, I am uh, a very, uh, OK, yes. I'm a wanderer, so um, I'm super pleased to be here, and I'm really pleased to see this um, collection of workshops turn into a conference, because I think it's fabulous to kind of bring all these communities together that are talking about um, a very important and timely topic, in my opinion. Um, so thank you guys for inviting me. And in an interesting way, I'm going to be, I think, actually connecting between Sebastian and Claudia's um, great presentations. It may not be apparent until I get to the end that there's a connection, but I personally think there's a connection. So I'm going to be talking about um, structure, not surprisingly. So both structure in the inputs to our machine learning and AI algorithms and structure in the outputs. And you know, for this community in particular, the structure in the output is pretty obvious. So uh, you know, one of the things we may be trying to do is construct a knowledge graph. And there's all kinds of interesting structured prediction-y kinds of problems in doing that. Um, and then, of course, we've seen a bunch of talks that have talked about already how you, you know, I argue that there's already a lot of structure in the input already, but if you have a knowledge graph on top of that, you can exploit it even more. So what I want to do, and which I think a lot of other folks here want to do as well, is to change this um, knowledge extraction from a pipeline into something where it's more of a knowledge construction loop. So you extract some structure from the you know, unstructured text. Once you have that structure, that is the lever that allows you to extract more. And then on top of it, there's a whole kind of meta uh, knowledge construction that's happening. You know, we're at the very beginning of that in terms of what we're doing. Um, so getting to common sense reasoning, causal reasoning, and more. So my goal is to kind of build these tools that kind of mix the data-driven together with the knowledge-driven reasoning. How do we do that? And in particular, how do we do that in a scalable, interpretable, explainable, and extensible way? Um, so in this talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide you with some um, patterns, some tools, and some templates for structure. And in doing this, the patterns that I'm going to go over, I think, are super easy, super basic. And I don't care what kind of method you use, you should think about whether you can incorporate these into your methods. Because I've found over and over again for all kinds of problems, even this like little bit of structured reasoning buys you a ton in terms of accuracy um, and performance and whatever your performance measure is. Uh, then in tools, you know, uh, not surprisingly, I'm going to you know, tell you about our own hammer. Um, and there I'll go into a little bit of technical detail uh, about it. And then in the last part, I'm going to talk about templates. And the templates, that's where I'm really going to highlight a bunch of Jay's work, uh, my current uh, PhD student, Varun Embar, around applying these things to knowledge graphs. So for the patterns, I'm going to express these patterns as logical rules. And the logical rules have a bunch of advantages. They're, um, they capture the structure easily. They're interpretable. But beware that after I go through expressing them as logical rules, then I'm going to back off on that. 
and allow for a more um, noise and um, inconsistencies and so on. So that will be coming up. Um, so the patterns that I'm going to go over that I think are ubiquitous to structured prediction are collective classification, link prediction, and entity resolution. And I want to represent these each as kind of little fragments of logical rules that help you kind of Testing, testing, all right. Um, so the first pattern is uh, inferring the labels of nodes in a graph. And so how do you write this as a pattern? You write it as follows. You have a local predictor that gives you some uh, noisy label um, L for a node X, but then the part that makes it collective is the fact that you have these rules where um, you propagate the information. And you can see this by the fact that you have the thing that you're trying to infer, which is the label, on both sides of the rule. So if I have a label L for a node X, there's a link between X and Y, then um, Y may have that label as well. So this comes up over and over when you're trying to infer any kind of attribute for users and so on. I want to give a little uh, pattern that's slightly more complex, which is around figuring out stance in online debate. And so um, this example um, is supposed to illustrate, I have people, they're making posts on some particular topic, and then the arrows, the red arrow is a disagreement link, the green arrow is an agreement link, and the question is, what are the stances on the topic? So are they kind of pro or anti? And I'm going to give a little vignette for this, but this work is uh, work by my former PhD student, Danya Sridhar, uh, who's now doing a postdoc at Columbia. Um, there's an ACL paper on this that goes into a lot more detail about it. But just in terms of the pattern, the idea is that we have some kind of local information, and you would use some sort of local classifier for this to predict a label for a document, either pro or anti. Um, then similarly, now I'm also going to be labeling links. I'm going to use some local classifier to predict whether or not it's an agreement link or a disagreement link. And so again, all of these are a bunch of local classifiers giving me noisy information. The structured piece comes in when I then make use of these kind of labels, put them together with a rule that says something like, okay, if a user is pro and they, uh, another user agrees with them, then the other user will be pro. Similarly, if they're pro, they disagree, then they'll be anti. And it gives you this nice way of propagating agreements and disagreements throughout the um, network and doing it in a structured way. So using this, I can infer um, the pro and anti. Okay, so that's the first pattern. The second pattern that, again, I think comes up over and over again is when you're trying to infer the existence of edges. So now we're not doing edge labeling, but predicting the existence. Um, and the pattern here is that you're going to do some sort of similarity reasoning. So you um, have an edge um, between X and Y, Y and Z are similar, 
then you may have an edge between X and Z. So you see that there's a dependence because the link variable is the thing that I'm trying to infer. So instantiating this, the canonical example of this is for recommender systems. In recommender systems, um, you can instantiate this similarity propagation rule in terms of similarity of items. So if I have an observed link that a user likes an item, then I have a similar item, I can potentially infer that the user will like the second item. Similarly, I can reason about similarity of users. And again, I get this dependence of the links on each other. And then the last uh, pattern is around entity resolution. Entity resolution, we've seen entity linking and so on. But the fundamental problem is figuring out when two nodes refer to the same underlying entity. The pattern here is, again, we'll use local information. So we'll use something about the similarity of the names. We can use something about the similarity of the neighborhood, what they link to. But the structured piece is adding in, in this case, a transitivity rule that says if X and Y are the same, Y and Z are the same, then X and Z are the same. So transitivity. Understanding when this applies in your domain is super important. It will give you a huge bump up in um, performance. But in not all domains do you have transitivity. So it's important to realize when you have instead a setting where you're doing a matching problem, which instead says if X and Y are the same and Y and Z are not the same, then X and Z can't be the same. So this is a mutual exclusion kind of constraint. And particularly with knowledge graphs, this is an incredibly powerful component of doing the reasoning that goes into knowledge graphs. So the last um, pattern that I'll mention around entity resolution is co-occurrence. Again, we've already seen examples of this, but it's a useful pattern uh, if x1 and x2 are the same. Y1 co-occurs with X1, Y2 co-occurs with X2, then it may be the case that X1 and Y2 are the same. So these are all useful patterns. And the thing that I'm really interested in is actually doing them all at the same time. So not just doing one of them, but how do you get it to scale to do all of them at the same time? And I've represented them as logical rules which have advantages, but logical rules also have a bunch of disadvantages. So it's generally intractable. You can't handle inconsistencies. And one of the things that I was talking about was similarities. Similarities are not easy to represent in logic. So next I want to talk about a tool that um, we've been working on in my group for addressing these problems. And this tool comes very much from the statistical relational learning community where there's a lot of work that tries to reason about structure together with uncertainty and do collective inference. Um, there's been a bunch of different languages that have been proposed for this. And you know we're going to add a language into that mix called PSL, uh, which stands for probabilistic soft logic. And very much PSL builds on the best of what has already been done. You'll see syntactically it looks very much like Markov uh, logic. What we feel like we've gotten to a place where we found a sweet spot in terms of expressivity, tractability, and actual applications in a bunch of different areas. So what is PSL? It's a declarative probabilistic programming language where you know, we have predicates, we have rules. The rules now are weighted, and they can either be hard constraints 
or they can represent some sort of dependence. A PSL program is a set of rules together with data that defines a probability distribution over all of the unobserved attributes. And you know, for more information, this website, we have open source code, we have a ton of different examples in different domains, and this reference gives the key information. Um, what's different about PSL is the fact that unlike most of the languages, the random variables are continuous value. This continuous value can be interpreted as a degree of truth. It can be interpreted as a similarity. But mathematically, the cool thing is that making use of this, we can map logical inference into convex optimization. And that um, allows us to fundamentally go from these kind of disadvantages of logical rules and turn them into advantages so that we have a tractable method that can handle inconsistencies and can represent similarity. And there's some really beautiful foundations for the semantics of PSL that I want to, you know, try and give you a taste for. And these are coming from um, my former PhD student, Stephen Bach, who's now an assistant professor at Brown, uh, postdoc Bert Wong, who is an assistant professor at Virginia Tech, where they were able to show that one mathematical um, formalization which I'm going to flash up here, but I'm going to show you how you get to it under three different interpretations, is um, uh, applies across these different interpretations, where the interpretations come from theoretical computer science, machine learning, and AI. So one is from randomized algorithms, one is from graphical models, and one is from soft logic. And the approach that is coming from randomized algorithms, I'm guessing, is the one that will be kind of most familiar to the audience, where we're going to take these weighted rules, we're going to write them out as in a clausal form. Um, and so we have weights, and we have the literals, the uh, negated and the non-negated. Um, we can formalize this as a weighted max set problem. Awesome, you know, this is a well-known NP-hard problem. But now what we're going to do is we're going to make use of a different interpretation for the variables. So now rather than viewing them as 0, 1, we're going to view them as rounding probabilities, the probability that we round up to one or down to zero. And it turns out that there's this nice result from theoretical computer science that says you can bound the expectation using a linear program and you can bound it and get an optimization um, guarantee in doing that. And if you look at the functional form for this, it exactly matches, if you memorize the slide um, two slides ago, the form that I presented. So this is one interpretation as rounding probabilities to get to this relaxation of the problem. Another one comes from graphical models, and now we're um, going to view our setup as a big graphical model where the weighted rules are going to be the potential function. So we have uh, the random variables, the rules. These are now converted into potential functions, but they're kind of weird potential functions. So they're kind of these logical uh, potential functions. And we can write out the distribution that this 
represents in kind of a standard graphical model energy form. Um, and then the inference problem would be to find the assignment that maximizes the probability. And this is just an equivalence between the um, uh, different, the first problem and the second problem. But now what's interesting is how do we do approximate inference here? So if we were to do variational inference and variational inference to find the consistent set of marginal distributions, that's one way that we could solve the problem. Unfortunately, this turns into exponentially many constraints, and so that's not going to work. But what we can do is there's a long line of work in local consistency relaxations. We can make use of this line of work, instantiate it in the context of our models, introduce the marginals, some pseudo-marginals, and now solve a problem that just looks at consistency among them, so rewriting the formula. And what Steve and Bert were able to show is that by doing some manipulation, making use of KKT conditions, we could push in and re-express this formula and get out the same optimization that we had before. So we have this equivalence, and then the last equivalence is something that's coming from AI, soft logic. It turns out you can make use of a particular interpretation of uh, continuous values in logic using Lukashevitz logic. You do um, some pretty straightforward math. The interpretation now is a little bit clearer because now what we're trying to do is we're looking at the rules and we're looking at their distance to satisfaction and we're minimizing the distance to satisfaction. Um, and that ends up resulting in the same thing. So the really nice result that they got was that there's this equivalence. Now, PSL has a bunch of other components. Um, so we've gone beyond this and added in some more general forms of constraint. But a PSL program, this is the stance program from before, basically turns out to be a program, some data, it defines a distribution. Um, we've done a lot of systems work to get this to be really fast. I don't have time to go into that, but current student Eric Augustine has done some awesome work, and I'm happy to go into more details about getting this all to really scale significantly. What I now want to turn to is how we use this in the context of knowledge graphs. And this is you know, very much work by um, Jay uh, Pujara. He really pushed and did some excellent work in this space. Um, I am not going to do justice to it in this short time. But the piece, and tying back to the patterns that I was talking about before, Knowledge graph construction fundamentally has the collective classification, the link prediction, and the entity resolution involved. But then on top of it, it has this um, additional constraints. So ontological constraints, cons uh, subsumption constraints, and so on. And it also oftentimes has some information about the confidence of your extractions and so on. And it turns out that PSL is an awesome vehicle for kind of putting all of those together, but putting them together in a kind of soft way where you're able to kind of trade off these things. And um, there's a little example where we're extracting some facts about beetles and books and being able to reason about these f facts and um, extract out, you know, this is a teeny tiny fragment. But the cool thing is, you know, this is the PSL program that Jay was using. Um, and so it has this ability to kind of capture 
the um, ontological constraints and the um, propagation of reasoning and so on. And in work that he did with uh, several folks, so some work with um, William Cohn at CMU, some work while he was at Google on a number of different um, KBs that you know you guys are all familiar with, he was able to kind of look at how each component of a PSL program was able to um, do a better job at the full, not just the knowledge graph com completion task, but the full inference from all these noisy facts. And this is a summary slide that shows Compared to you know what we started off trying to do was use MLNs for it, and we just were finding you know it went scale, so that was part of the motivation for turning to PSL. And each component, you know, taking into account the ontology, taking into account the confidences, taking into account entity resolution, contributed. Um, so we can do this, so both the statistical and the semantic features help, and on top of it, we could do it fast. So we could do this um, even in you know, a single-threaded implementation. We were doing this in a couple hours for things that were taking you know, days and weeks for other approaches are just not working. So that's awesome. This is just a highlight of those results. Turning to a different setting where, you know, we've been hearing a lot about embeddings and um, vector representations. Jay and colleagues also have a really nice EMNLP paper where they're looking at embedding methods um, and putting them together with these uh, uh, more structure methods. And in that work, they were showing that while the embedding methods work great when you have a lot of data and the data is clean, in as you move to more real settings, you know these are results for um, actually NEL data. You have a lot more noise, it's much sparser, and that's a place where adding in this kind of structural component is really important. And um, Jay is you know, going on and looking at how do you um, integrate these more. I think there's tons of opportunity. I'm doing some stuff with William Wang at UCSB that's around integrating these. But the um, key result is PSL helps when the data is noisy and sparse. So how do we mix the techniques that have both those properties? Um, my student, uh, Varun Embar, has been doing some nice work specifically in product graphs. So product graphs where we're either learning the um, concept ontology, and this uh, we were very grateful to DiffBot for um, uh, working with us and um, using their data, and some work that he's doing with Amazon where we're looking at um, uh, product uh, differentiation. So, in closing, uh, I've, of course, I want to thank my students. They're awesome. Um, you've seen a couple examples of them. Um, also, my sponsors, um, in particular, uh, Relational AI is one of the companies that we're uh, just starting to work with. Uh, Nick here, um, they're using some PSL. Uh, techniques and having some nice successes, so we're happy about that. And to close, I think I hopefully gave you some just ideas for whatever method you use. Uh, you know, we have our tool. If you're at all interested in using PSL, we're happy to help people get started and so on. Um, and I think there's a real opportunity to develop these AI methods and really mix you know, unstructured and structured, probabilistic and logic, and fundamentally data-driven and knowledge-driven. And you know, this is the right community to be doing that, for sure. And so 
there's tons of opportunities here. So, thanks. Hi there, thank you for the great talk. Um, is, uh, do you think is there a ways to, uh, in those kind of methods uh, that you describe three uh, parts, is there a ways to incorporate uh, more hierarchical properties, for example, like that our uh, entities might be defined on multiple levels, so in, an, in the same ontology you might have a primitive, then like a subpart, and then like an object. Uh, is, uh, are these methods can help with that as well? I think that's a really great question, a really interesting area in general. Um, I think there's like an easy answer, which is like, yeah, sure, you could incorporate that at a certain level, and I think you would get benefit from um, encoding that. But then I think there's an opportunity to actually get that deeper into the models that one develops so that it's more of a, a true hierarchical model in terms of the parameterization. And so I think kind of understanding the, the particular setting that you're looking at, whether it's a matter of, yes, add those in, in a vanilla way as constraints, I would expect that you could do better doing that, or uh, yes, add them in in a more sophisticated way in terms of how the parameters are nested, and that that would be quite interesting too. Got it. So you're saying there's might be methods that are uh, d uh, like disentangling and separating this structure, hierarchical structure, in more uh, like from first principles, from like. Uh, information properties rather than human definitions. Is, is that what you're saying? Uh, I'm not quite sure I'm saying that, but it, it sounds good. So I wish I said hey, that. Thank you. 